Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll move on this listener right now in your gentle, loving, powerful, and merciful way as they listen to this message from All Nations Church in Tallahassee. Amen. While you're still standing, take your Bibles. We're going to read the scripture from Mark chapter 6. It will be on the screen. Reading from the New International Version, or excuse me, from the New King James Version, the Bible says, Mark 6, beginning in verse 45. Immediately he made his disciples get into a boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent away the multitude. When he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea. He was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. I want you to hear that statement. He came walking to them on the sea, and would have passed them by. How many times have we been so focused on our problems, we miss a God moment? We miss what he wanted to show us, reveal to us. When they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them and the wind ceased. Listen to these words. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marvel another translation says they were overwhelmed with astonishment look at verse 52 the most significant verse in this passage for they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened how many times have we missed what God had for us because our heart was hard. Father, I pray now that you'd anoint the preaching of your word. Put me on like a coat and wear me today. Let these words be life. Let these words be conviction by the power of the Holy Spirit. Change our hard hearts. Show us the areas where we have hardened our hearts. Bring change to us today. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, the word I have for you is not an easy one. Matter of fact, it's a pretty difficult thing that I want to share with you this morning because none of us really ever want to admit that we could have hard hearts. That's not consistent with what we know about Christianity and discipleship and walking with Jesus. It doesn't mesh. Matter of fact, there was a time that I thought only people that were in rebellion against God or people that were hating God had hard hearts. There was a time when I thought the hardness of heart, can I have a little more light guys? When the hardness of heart was actually only applied to people on the other side of God. Those serving the enemy, not serving the king of kings. Read the scriptures, Pharaoh is probably the greatest example of a hardened heart. The Israelites on occasion had hardened hearts. In the New Testament, there is one group that stands out so clearly, and that's the Pharisees, whose hearts have been hardened. Hardened by their religion, hardened by their teaching, hardened by their rules, hardened by their laws. Hardened against what God was trying to do in that day and that time through His Son, Jesus Christ. I used to think that it was only the God-haters that had hardened hearts until the first time God told me I had a hard heart. Maybe you've never had that moment. Down through the years, I've had many of them. Because when people hurt you, the natural result is to harden your heart. When people fail you or disappoint you, the natural result is to harden your heart. You build a wall so that never happens again. The problem is, you're closing yourself off to the things that God can do in your relationships 
when you build the wall. Maybe your heart was hardened because a church hurt you. And if you've been in church any time at all, you're going to know that at some point, somebody's going to hurt you in that congregation. It's just going to happen. And if you choose to harden your heart, then you find yourself coming to the place where you say, they're all fake, they're all phony, there's nothing real, I don't need that. When in fact, what you need more than anything is for a believer to put their arms around you and love you back to the place where you can forgive and let the walls fall and the hardness of your heart dissipate. Maybe it was a spouse, an ex betrayed you, turned their back on you, and you hardened your heart against men or against women because of what happened there. And you will never again know a meaningful relationship because your heart has been hardened. It's a tough thing to deal with. It's a tough thing to address. It's a tough thing to get a handle on. Jesus knew the disciples were in trouble in Mark chapter 6. The fourth watch of the night, about 4 a.m., he knew they were in trouble. The winds were against them. The storm was great. They were tired. And they hadn't accomplished their goal. And so he went walking to them on the sea. I want you to notice this. By the way, the notes are on the app. You can follow along there. I want you to notice this. He walked on top of the very thing that was trying to kill them. Somebody needs to hear that today because all you can see is what's trying to kill you. You don't see the master who's right beside you. You don't see the Lord who is right there with you. All you see is the storm and the wind and the waves and you're exhausted and you just can't go on anymore. He walked on top of the very thing that was trying to kill them. You know what that says to me? That says to me he was completely in control. He was totally in control. I've come to tell some of you this morning, you need to allow that hardened place in your heart to dissolve so that once again, you can see the hand of God, experience the grace of God, know the mercy of God, and see he's in charge of your life. He's totally in control. Time and again through the years, God's kind of slapped me in the face with this. Look at verse 52 one more time. For they had not understood about the loaves. What's it talking about? Well, if you read the whole chapter, just before sending them across the Sea of Galilee, Jesus had fed 5,000 people with a few loaves and a few fishes. And they picked up the fragments so they could eat too. It's an amazing miracle. But it says they hadn't considered, another word is understood, the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. Because their heart was hardened. I want to talk to you about a hardened heart today. Let me give you five signs of a hardened heart. This is from Corey Neumeyer. He said, you really don't celebrate and you really don't cry. A hardened heart. You stop genuinely caring. So much of what's supposed to be meaningful feels mechanical. Passion is hard to come by. And maybe the most telling indicator, you no longer believe the best about people. All you can see is the worst. A hardened heart. If we think about what God has done in our lives. And too many times we choose to relate more with the natural than with the supernatural. We only see where we're at and we forget where we've been. We forget what he has done. We forget his grace and his mercy that time and again had rested over our lives. Let me define hardened for you. It's defined as cold. insensitive, unfeeling, unyielding. You ever know anyone like that? I've been that person. You've been that person. Can I, can I be real today? When we came to this church eight and a half years ago, my heart got pretty hard because all the nonsense I had to deal with. 
Then I had to deal with the plaza a couple years in, and there was another area in my heart that got hard. And people would say, why are you so hard? And my answer would be, because I have to be to survive. But I tell you, that's absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. The only way you survive is by allowing God to break that hardened heart and to give you once again a passion for where he has placed you. Let me say that again. And give you once again a passion for where he has placed you. You see, when we have hardened hearts, we can never be satisfied. We can never be content. We're jumping from pillar to post. That church is no good. That preacher is no good. They said this. They said that. I disagree. Can I tell you something? You will never find a church that you will agree with everything that is said. You'll never find a pastor that you will agree with every word he speaks or she speaks. You have to come to the place where you say, God, renew my passion for where I am. You planted me here. Now help me to grow here and bring fruit here. That's pretty good preaching, whether you know it or not. Fifteen times in the book of Exodus, it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. He was resisting the one that can't be resisted. He was fighting against the one who never loses. He is rebelling against the one who quenches and stops every rebellion. Fifteen times he hardened his heart. A hardened heart. Dulls our ability to perceive and to understand. Mark chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. Put that slide on the screen. Jesus gave five characteristics to the disciples of a hard heart. Number one, unable to perceive. That means observe. Number two, unable to understand. That means comprehend. You don't comprehend what you observe. Number three, you're unable to see. Number four, you're unable to hear. Number five, you're unable to remember. And they're all speaking of our ability in the spiritual realm. So a hard heart is characterized by the inability to perceive spiritually. To perceive spiritually. When spiritual things are perceived, a hard-hearted person will keep that person from understanding. They may see what the Lord's trying to do, but they're never able to apply it to their own lives so that change occurs. That's what it means. We perceive, but we don't comprehend. We see, but we don't comprehend. When people are hard-hearted toward God, it's as though they're spiritually blind and deaf, but they still come to church. They still sing the songs if they like them. They don't complain if the volume is right and the temperature is correct and the preacher is short. I don't mean in stature, I mean in sermon length, all right? I don't fit either one of those, so you may as well give that up. They can't remember. They can't remember what God has done. They can't remember what God has said. It's a major indication of a hard heart when we don't remember where he's brought us from. See, and when we don't remember, we are quick to take credit ourselves. How many times you've had someone say, well, I used to be this, that, or the other, without giving God any credit whatsoever. I quit cold turkey without giving God any glory or honor whatsoever. Anytime we fail to perceive what God has done and remember his goodness and his blessing over our lives, we are hard hearted people often tell me i can't believe you can memorize and remember scripture like this you want to talk to somebody who can talk to doug apple he's amazing and they imply that i must have some kind of a special gift i don't see those same people can tell me who won the last three super bowls they can tell me the batting average of every good major league player they can tell me the actors in every movie that they've seen for the last five years. But they can't remember the word. You know why? Because it's a matter of focus. 
My focus is on the Word. That doesn't mean I haven't watched the Super Bowl. I have. The last one was when Kansas City won. We watched it because Yvonne's from Kansas City. But I don't know anything about that. I don't remember anything whatsoever. Doesn't mean that I don't know something about movies. It's just not my focus. The Word is my focus. And what you focus on will determine what you put priority on. A hard heart is an inability to perceive spiritually. Very quickly, four things I want to give you that are indicators of a hard heart. You can write them down or you can pull them off the notes on the app. Number one, whatever you consider, your heart softens toward. And whatever you fail to consider, your heart becomes hardened to. Listen to me, parents. You have a responsibility to put a spiritual knowledge, desire, and hunger in the hearts of those you are raising. Your children are a gift from God. They're not yours, they're His. He loaned them to you. And you as a parent have a responsibility to sow into their lives the things of God. If you never open the book in front of them, Probably not doing that. Never pray for them or pray over them. Probably not doing that. I debated about telling this story, but I'm going to do it. Some years ago, my daughter got pregnant out of wedlock. She ended up marrying the man. And my heart hardened towards him for years because of what had happened. But after that first little boy was born, and then a second, I started seeing something in that guy I had never seen before. I could sit down in their house of a morning before those kids went to school, and the Bible was opened, and they read the Word, and He prayed over them, and my heart melted. Hear me, folks, it's your responsibility to raise those kids in the fear, the nurture, and the admonition of the Lord. And that only happens by living it in front of them, modeling it in front of them, pouring it into them, and giving them opportunities to hear the voice of God. Not going to happen any other way. By the way, grandparents, we have the same responsibility. We certainly do. Mark 6, 52 says, They considered not the miracle of the loaves, and their heart was hardened. The word consider means to study, to ponder, to deliberate, to examine, to think upon. A scriptural term equivalent to it would be to meditate, whatever we meditate on. We could even substitute the word focus for consider. The disciples' hearts were hard because they didn't focus on the miracle they just participated in. All they saw was the storm they were in. They forgot. They didn't remember what Jesus had just done. What's harder? Still the wind and the waves? Or to feed 5,000 men plus whatever families may have been there with a few loaves and a few fish? What's harder? question is neither because none of this is hard for God. God does everything and does it well. He's simply looking for a people who will soften their heart and let him work through them. You see, anytime we focus only on the natural, our heart hardens toward the supernatural. Last Sunday you had a, heard an amazing testimony from Olivia about what God has done in her life and brought healing into her body. I couldn't believe we weren't shouting and dancing and saying hallelujah. That was an amazing thing. Why is it we're so casual? Because our hearts are hardened toward the supernatural. Because our focus is on the natural. If you'd be honest, and I took a survey... While she was sharing her testimony, some of you thought that's wonderful, but where are we going to go to lunch? That's wonderful, but i got to get over to mama's or daddy's. You're already thinking beyond where you're at to where you want to go. You focus on the natural, not the supernatural. So when the supernatural occurs, you don't even remember it. A hardened heart. 
Anybody in this, in this room ridden in the car with my wife when she's driving? Go ahead, slip up your hands. It's okay. You're a survivor. You're a survivor. I call her evil Knievel. She knows one speed, and that's faster. On Run for the Wall, she drove the chase truck, which is at the back of the pack. And they're going 91 minute and zero the next. And she loved it. Amazing. Didn't surprise me for a bit. When I agreed to let her drive that chase truck, I was told she'll be a half a mile behind the pack, not in that danger. Two days into the run, I found out, oh no, she's right in the middle of it. And she loves it. You see, if I'm going to ride in the car with somebody, I don't want them driving by faith. I want their eyes open and them ready to adjust to whatever's happening in front of them. Hear me, folks. Too many times we rotely go through our Christian life seeing only the natural and ignoring the supernatural. They had just witnessed a major miracle. Five loaves, two fish, 5,000 people. What an awesome thing. But their mind didn't stay on the miracle. The mind only saw the storm. And their hearts were hardened. Look, look at Mark 6, 45. It says, Jesus made them get into the boat. He constrained them. He compelled them. He said, you got to get in the boat and go to the other side. It wasn't their choice. They didn't choose to be in that situation. They didn't choose to be in that problem. He made them go there. Knowing that a storm was about to erupt. Knowing what he was sending them into. Here's the application. Too many times when bad things, tough things, difficult things come into our lives, we, uh, we start blaming him. Why would you let that happen to me? You're a God of grace. You're a God of love. You're a God of mercy. This shouldn't be happening to me without ever realizing he is leading us into it. And he's leading us into it to reveal another aspect of his person, of his power, of his ability, of his grace, and of his mercy. Oh, folks, listen. If all we do is sit around and sing kumbaya, we have no problems, we have no challenges, and we will never see the God that overcomes. But when we determine we're going to engage in the spiritual realm, and we're going to fight the good fight of faith, and we're going to walk the walk he leads us in. There will be battles. There will be trials. There will be tests. There will be situations we don't have an answer to. But go back to Mark 6, 45. He made them get in the boat and leave. What does that tell you? It tells you he's responsible for him. He's responsible for him. Oh, listen, when you're in the fight, you're not responsible if you're following him. He's responsible for you, and he already has a plan to bring you to victory. He compelled them. He made them go to the other side. They didn't want to go. They were there because he made them go out on the sea. And if they would have been thinking spiritually rather than naturally, they would have understood He'll take care of us. Just as he was concerned and had compassion on the multitude because they hadn't eaten, and he took the loaves and the fishes and he blessed them and he broke them and he fed them all, he took care of them. He would have taken care of the disciples that night. Come on, folks, I'm challenging you. You need to dig deeper. You need to let that hardened heart melt. And you need to see that every problem, every trial, every circumstance that you walk through, he's already there. He's in control. He's not forsaken you. He didn't abandon you. But rather, he's going to lead you through it to ultimate victory. Instead of being surprised and thinking Jesus was a ghost, they would have been expecting him to show up. Think about that. They were amazed. They were shocked. They were overwhelmed when they saw him walking on the water. They were afraid. They said, it's a ghost. No, if they would have thought about the miracle he just performed and understood he was in control and he sent them there, they would have been looking for him to come to them. But they weren't. How many times do we blame him instead of anticipate his arrival? 
How many times do we shake our finger at the heavens and say, God, why did you put me into this? When in reality, he has led you to that place to reveal to you a greater dimension of his glory, of his honor, of his power, of his might, of his ability. How many times have we been just like the disciples? And our hearts hardened. Number two, if we're not so dominated by the natural, we'll not be surprised by the supernatural. Things like we heard last week from Olivia, that shouldn't be the occasional occurrence. That should be every single day. Because my God desires to be Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. Oh, come on, folks. We've got to change our perspective. We've got to see and seek and desire and long for the miraculous power of God. Amen. See, when we don't, we think, well, that's a one-time occurrence. He did it once. He probably won't do it again. Do you understand the nature of Jesus? That more than anything, He wants to show you how much He loves you. How much He cares for you. How much He provides for you. And He can do that supernaturally. I had my shoulder operated on, on, I think June 9th was the date, I think. I was telling Rodney Rowland about the surgery. They told me it's going to be six months before you can use that shoulder at all. Rodney said, it's not going to be that long. Why did he say that? Because he didn't see the natural word. He saw a supernatural result. When I was at the therapist on Friday, she said, you're where you should be at five months, at three months. Oh, come on, folks. I'm telling you, when you walk through it, it's an opportunity for him to show you who he is. Now, would I have rather he just healed it? Absolutely. Absolutely. But he took me through it. To prove to me, not to you, to me, his power, his grace, his goodness, his ability to soften my heart so that I would stop looking at the natural and start looking for the supernatural. If the disciples would have remembered the loaves and the fishes, they wouldn't have seen a ghost. They would have seen Jesus. They would have been looking for him. And when he showed up, they wouldn't be afraid. They'd be throwing up their hands saying, deliverance is here. Deliverance is here. Stop looking at the natural. Focus on the supernatural. Number three, we have the power to determine what our heart accepts or rejects. You see, I'm convinced we don't act in a way that we haven't already considered. Our actions are the overflow of our mind. And we never act in a way that we haven't ever considered so control your thoughts, and you'll control your actions. They saw a ghost. They were afraid. Control your thoughts, and you'll control your actions. Simple but profound. I just threw this in because I like this statement. If you live in a graveyard long enough, you'll quit crying when people die. Think about that. Let it soak into your spirit. If you live in a graveyard, a place of death, focusing on the natural long enough, you'll quit crying when people die. The hardest thing a hard-hearted person has to do is admit I am. And a hard-hearted person is always the last to know that they're hard-hearted. So how do people become hard-hearted? Number four. Hard-hearted people are typically the way they are because something happened somewhere in their past that broke their heart. Let that settle. Because something happened somewhere in their past that broke their heart. They risked. They were vulnerable. They trusted. They were hurt, betrayed, or rejected. And in an effort to protect themselves, they said, never Again. 
and the heart grew hard. The walls were built. Many cases when we are hard-hearted, then we see a root of bitterness taking root in our soul. Often that bitterness flows from the anger that we experience because of that situation. That bitterness then becomes hatred. You know what Jesus said? If you hate your brother, it's the same as murdering him. Wow. Hard-hearted people need to be right. And they're often extremely self-righteous. Hard-hearted people, listen to me, are not bad people. They're broken people. Tom, would you come back? They're not bad people. They're broken people. We wall others out. And as a result, unintended, the consequences, we wall ourselves in. See, a wall doesn't just keep somebody out. It keeps you in. And it keeps you in that spot, that position. So how does a hard-hearted person escape this condition? How does that happen? Same way they got into it. By letting God break their heart. By coming to him and saying, I'm unable, and I don't want to be this way. By coming to him and saying, would you change me? Would you deliver me? Would you set me free? Just as an unhealed, broken heart becomes hardened, so the hardened heart must become broken to be healed again. You made it to the end of the message, and now what? Is God leading you to make a change? Are you needing a good church home where you can grow and help others grow as you fulfill your part in the body of Christ? Then we invite you to join us at All Nations Church on Sharer Road in Tallahassee, a multicultural church founded on the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. Our Sunday morning service is at 1030 and Wednesday night service at 7 plus youth group and kid power and small groups and more. For more information, visit our website, allnationstallahassee.com.